Hello and welcome to this video about topography and archaeology. I am Dr. Nathan Wilson. I am an anthropological archaeologist. I'm involved in the archaeology of the Gulf Coast of Mexico with a particular focus on lithic studies, stone tools, and political economy. Um, for the last few years I've also been um, teaching classes in topography in the Department of Anthropology at the Universidad Veracruzana in Veracruz. Today I want to talk with rather briefly about topography in archaeology, the importance of taking into account the physical landscape in archaeological studies, and the importance of contextualizing our research and analyses within a physical space. Topography is defined as both the science that focuses on the study and graphical representation of the Earth's surface and the Earth's surface itself. What I mean by that is that we can use the word topography when we want to refer to the specific field of study focusing on the Earth's physical surface, but we can also use the word topography to refer to the Earth's surface itself. I might say, for example, that the topography of the Mexican Gulf Coast is much less pronounced and diverse than that of the Mexican Central Highlands. In this video, I will focus on the second use of topography as a reference to the surface of the Earth, which consists of changes in vertical distances across horizontal space. From a local or regional perspective, we can refer to portions of the Earth's surface as local terrain, the physical landscape, or local or regional topography. These geographic units are part of the landscape, so it is important that we incorporate these units into the study of human behavior, since it is within the physical spaces that cultural processes take place. An important concept with which to highlight the interrelationship between culture and the physical landscape is the spatial context, the physical environment in which all cultural processes take place, be they ritual activity, social and economic interaction, subsistence activities, or political processes. Populations interact with their spatial context in a continuous way. Therefore, we cannot study the cultures and societies of the past in an isolated manner, without context, if we want to understand the dynamics of development and cultural change. We can divide the spatial context into three different categories based on the spatial extent of an area or the distance between points. Well, on, honestly, we can construct many different categories within the general subject of spatial context if we want to, but I, I find this simple three category division to be useful. By separating the spatial context into three distinct categories, we can better contextualize a variety of cultural processes that often take place at different spatial scales. These three categories that we can use are the local scale, the regional scale, and the interregional scale. Although we use distance or area to define these different scales, in that the interregional scale would necessarily be larger or referring to greater distance than the other two scales, we don't need to necessarily establish rigid boundaries for these different categories. For example, we don't need to establish a specific distance or area size as a boundary or cutoff point between two scales, like say 100 miles being the limit for the regional scale so that interaction taking place up to and including 100 miles would be included within the regional scale, whereas interaction taking place over a distance of say 101 miles would be categorized as interregional interaction. These divisions are general and they're not rigid categories. Now I want to very briefly discuss each of these three scales, and I want to go in order based on size. So we're going to start with the smallest, the local scale. So with the local scale, the focus of study is usually placed on the settlement and the surrounding area. Or if we are not necessarily focusing on a settlement per se, we would still focus on the archaeological site and or the local area around it. These can include um, like a resource extraction zone, like a mine or an agricultural production area, like we can see here, uh, Pisac, uh, Great Terraces of Pisac located in the Urubamba Valley, or the Sacred Valley of the Highlands of Peru. So talking about the local scale, um, cultural processes of interest at this scale often include um, agricultural or other productive activities, 
the use of space, architectural forms and organization. Here we can see Chan Chan um, located in coastal Peru. Um, we can also look at, you know, other settlement level organizational information and interaction. Well, also, you know, both the location of a site or settlement and the use of space with respect to topography can help us identify social, political, and economic processes. Um, we can think about issues of access, control of movement, the use and modification of the landscape for productive purposes, and various other, other issues, themes, and foci. Here at the uh, archaeological site of Tula, Hidalgo in Mexico, associated with the Toltecs, um, topographic analysis of the local terrain, the area within and around the settlement, is this analysis has played a, an important role in identifying vestiges of agricultural activities, such as leveling and other landscape modifications associated with agricultural terracing principally. Now these studies, these topographic studies and the identification and the recording of these agricultural activities have contributed to the construction of population estimates for the settlement, for Tula, during its early post-classic period um, fluorescence. With the regional scale, the focus of study extends to a larger area, such as the interaction between settlements, um, economic dynamics, and larger scale resource exploitation. As data such as settlement locations within the landscape are imperative in reconstructing regional political economic hierarchies. There are numerous examples in archaeology of regional surveys. Um, some very famous ones, for example, in Mexico, in the Valley of Mexico, the Valley of Oaxaca. And these have been used, the data derived from these have been used to basically reconstruct um, regional political hierarchies over time, over hundreds and even thousands of years based on settlement sizes and settlement distributions over time. Now the archeological study of, of the Copan Valley in Honduras, Copan being a, a pretty major Maya settlement during the classic period. Um, so uh, the regional survey of the Copan Valley, now this included large scale survey. Now this study contributed both to the, to the determination of the political boundaries of the Copan state and the identification of different chronologies in the sociopolitical collapse. Differences in the chronologies between urban settlements in the valley floor and more rural villages or rural settlements in the highlands of the area. But where rural depopulation within the Copan area was much slower and more drawn out, diachronically speaking, than the rapid depopulation of the larger settlements and the main urban centers, such as Copan. Now, the research here that I'm, I'm citing is not my own. It's um, primarily derived from that of Ankarin Freider and David Webster. At the interregional scale, our research interests revolve around questions such as long distance exchange, the distribution of artistic styles, and the long political reach of states, among many other things. Now, by incorporating topography into studies of this scale, we can build predictive models of interaction identifying potential transportation corridors, as well as potential geographic barriers to movement. Landscape studies in Sinaloa, Nayarit, and Jalisco, Mexico, this is on the Pacific coast of Mexico. Now these studies suggest that the movement of people and goods would have been facilitated by the energetic advantages of water transport along the coast, whereas interaction into the interior of the region, that is away from the coast, would have been impeded by the presence of mountain ranges. This is not to say that there was no interaction into the interior, but it was much easier to try to go longer distances along the coast due to the vast advantages of water transport. So as expected from these observations on the distribution of Aztatlan pottery and the Aztatlan cultural complex in the, primarily in the early post-classic period um, is much more common and widespread along the coastal areas than it is within the interior of this part of West Mexico, linking its distribution obviously to primarily coastal trade networks. And some of these, this study um, comes from people such as Isabel Kelly, Charles Kelly, uh, various other authors, and some of the work that can be found in the book, The Post-Classic Mesoamerican World by Michael Smith and Francis Burdan. So again, the Pacific coastal research is not my own. I am referring to other studies.
Cultural processes associated with settlement location, subsistence base, political interaction, and many more must take into account the local, regional, and interregional landscape. Access to resources, population size, interaction, and more are conditioned by the natural landscape. Therefore, we must acquire topographic data to contextualize our studies within their proper spatial context so that we can provide a more complete identification, explanation, and interpretation of past cultural processes and human agency. So that about does it for this video on topography and archaeology. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, or at least it wasn't too boring. Uh, thanks a lot, and um, take care.